My dear friends, the ankle fracture stock, uh, let me be putting forward that in this stock, our learning objectives are to learn how to analyze the injury pattern, to be able to prognosticate which are going to have good results and which are not really so good ones, which are the tough ones, which are the simple ones, which are to be managed conservatively, which are to be managed surgically. And once we talk of surgically, we talk about surgical techniques. And then the functional outcome, which finally depends, a lot depends on the post-operative rehabilitation. So I'm going to take these things one by one. And what I'm going to do is not a kind of any teaching session on the classifications. I'm not you know, trying to stress a particular implant when I'm talking about it. And it's, it's the management principles which I'm going to highlight. Then all these views which I'm going to express here, they are basically a combination of literature review and my own experience. And uh, I hope uh, if, if I'm differing from you anywhere, I'm open to the discussion and uh, you know, take something from, learn something from you guys as well. So we all know that ankle injuries, basically there are two mechanisms. One are the axial compression load, which produces pylon fractures, and the other is rotation in supinated or pronated foot, or this rotation could be in simple one plane, so-called adduction and abduction. So the rotation force on supinated or pronated foot will basically produce malleolar fractures, and along with that, some syndesmotic injuries. While the axial loading produces pylon, which has been discussed last week, so today we'll take up malleolar fractures and syndesmotic injuries primarily. So when we are analyzing the injury, the first thing which we patient lands up with us, we take the history. And in history, we should be able to differentiate a low velocity injury from a high velocity injury. So it's, is it a fall while just coming down the stairs? Is it a fall just uh, because the foot twisted? Or is it an injury just uh, due to a fall from a mobike or a very high velocity injury? So this, this gives us a lot indication about the, the kind of comminution, dislocation, and soft tissue injury, which is expected in high velocity cases. Usually there is no point trying to elicit the mechanisms as we have been taught in large Hansen classification, because patients really don't observe all that, you know, but the x-rays speak for it. So we'll know it from the x-rays. Duration since injury is important because the fresh fractures are to be dealt in a little different way. And the fractures which have gone old, maybe a month, six weeks, two months old, they are to be dealt in a little different way. Similarly, there is a bearing about comorbid illness. A diabetic patient, of course, the protocol goes different. The fixation goes a little different. A patient with smoking, the management goes a little different. So try to elicit important comorbid illness in the history and not just jump on to simply start treating or start going planning treatment from your own side. Similarly, in examination, so I say we all know by now it, we are orthopedic surgeons, we have been doing examination, you know, clinical checking and all that. But let me tell you the red flags. The red flags means one, you should not miss the massive swelling, the massive deformity, because in these two conditions, there may be a pressure on the skin from a dislocated bone and it could be an impending pressure necrosis of the skin, or it may be just about to produce wound, or it might have produced a wound already. So these red flags should be documented. And whenever these red flags are present, do not miss on doing a neurovascular examination simultaneously and document it. Now, when it comes to radiology, of course, the x-rays. So I always say in x-ray, there are a few visible things and there are a few invisible things. Means injuries which will be visible on the x-ray and injuries which you have to know by how they are produced. You have to imagine them. So what you see clearly is fracture, dislocation, subluxation, but what you don't see is ligament injury. What you don't see is recoil, that the dislocation took place and after the dislocation happened, you know, a recoil took place and the, you know, the, the bone came back to its position. It looks as if it is an undisplaced injury. But if you know the whole mechanism of injury, if you see the associated other injuries, you are able to classify this injury as stable versus unstable and accordingly plan your treatment. Let's start from here. So here you see a fracture, which is much below the level of ankle joint, near the tip. Here you see another case, again, much below the level of ankle joint. And this febula fracture is having a line which is below the level of ankle joint. So these are Weber A type of injuries. And they're also supination adduction stage one injuries, you know. Uh, then 
these are often low velocity stable injuries and are managed usually by cast they they need monitoring for displacement and if the displacement occurs or if the reduction in the beginning in the cast is not satisfactory that's the only time when you need to fix them otherwise they are primarily managed in cast now what happens in this kind of x ray pattern which you see here again the fibula fracture is either at the ankle joint level or below it ankle joint level or below it but the malleolar fracture is typically vertical or close to vertical so near transverse fibular fracture and a near vertical fracture line medially so how how could it have been produced well this is produced by supination adduction force which has gone beyond that stage one more force of supination adduction and that is why these are called in large hands and supination adduction stage two fractures but in weber classification these are also called weber a though they become bimalleolar that was unimalleolar this is a bimalleolar weber a and how do we manage this these are potentially unstable injuries and always and always need internal fixation so you fix them by stabilizing the lateral malleolus like you most often do the medial malleolus because these are transverse and you stabilize them by either lag screw or a tension band and medial malleolus you treat them like lateral malleolus or you treat them differently how differently this is stabilized by anti glide plate to neutralize the shear forces so here a plate is very important to neutralize the shear forces now this example i i think it, it, you all agree this is again a supination adduction type 2 injury but managed like this would you be happy the weight is fixed looks very good you know the both the fractures are used well fixed by screws but see what happened four weeks later it fell apart because this was not able to control the shear forces so it was revised by putting anti glide plate and by putting a stabilizing plate on the lateral side because it was already 4 weeks old so that's how you have to take care that if you forget the principles of managing vertical shear fractures they will go in for complications now let's see this example now here you see the fracture line is starting almost at the joint line ankle joint line and finishing almost where the syndesmosis is finishing so this is in the area of syndesmosis so this is a oblique fibula fracture line starting at the level of ankle close to syndesmosis and extending proximally without a disruption of the syndesmosis so without syndesmosis disruption means it is ser supination external rotation stage 2 injury because the forces which probably which produce this kind of a fracture they are external rotation of the talus on a supinated foot and this would first break the anterior tibiofibular syndesmotic ligament and then produce an oblique fracture so syndesmosis it is intact so here again i'm talking about what is invisible the number one that is this injury which is anterior tibiofibular syndesmotic ligament it is not visible to you on the x ray but it always happens and what is visible on the x ray is only the fibular fracture so here comes the visible and invisible things on the x ray so these are stable kind of fracture unless they have progressed to stage 3 which i'll tell you right uh, in the next slide so most often these are stable fracture and because the posterior tibiofibular syndesmotic ligament is not broken not torn so they are managed conservatively in a cast now how how do you take this decision so just learn about the stage 3 what happens in stage 3 in stage 3 the posterior syndesmotic ligament which i am showing you here is also broken so once it is broken the anterior as well as the posterior syndesmotic ligament the syndesmosis becomes unstable or it gets disrupted and once it gets disrupted the fragment of the lateral malleolus displaces so this is a syndesmotic injury with syndesmotic disruption that is stage 3 and how do you diagnose if you have to diagnose an unstable versus a stable injury which on a simple plain x ray ap view is looking to be stable you can always do a stress film that is a gravity assisted x ray with foot hanging off the edge of table and then you take an ap view like this and you find this medial opening 
If this is happening, that means actually this is not stage two, but this is stage three. So you have diagnosed it by stress view. The other way is if you happen to give a cast, please monitor it every week and monitor the syndesmosis radiology over first two weeks. If over first two weeks it doesn't displace, that, that means you are handling a stable injury, uh, stage two only. So the management guidelines are basically if you have stage three, then manage it with open reduction in tunnel fixation along with syndesmosis fixation. Now, what happens if the force is further, you know, more force is there in the external rotation? So bimalleolar fracture would happen. Of course, the syndesmosis disruption would happen. This malleolar fracture line would appear, and sometimes you will have a posterior malleolus. These are all supination external rotation stage four injuries or so-called Weber B bimalleolar injuries. So in these kind of injuries where you see a posterior malleolus, whenever you see a posterior malleolus, it's better always to do a CT scan because CT scan is going to show you the size of posterior malleolus. It is going to show you the, the displacement and it is going to give you a planning to how to manage. So as I said, these are stage four the, due to excessive external rotation four, one, two, three, and the four medial malleolus happening. This is how you see it in the axial view. This is how you see it in the axial view in a CT scan. You are seeing the first disruption here, second disruption of the fibula, third of the posterior malleolus, and fourth of the medial malleolus. So these are again bimalleolar fractures with syndesmotic disruption, supination external rotation stage four. And how do you manage them? If you manage them well by fixing all the malleoli, all three malleoli and syndesmosis, see the kind of results you are expecting. The full range of motion this patient is able to perform. And then we go to the next, another example. Now here, as soon as you see this X-ray, you are seeing this fracture line in the fibula, which is much above the syndesmosis level. And the syndesmosis is already opened up. There is a medial malleolus fracture, there is a syndesmosis opening, there is a fracture which is above the level of syndesmosis. So these are suprasyndesmotic fractures of the fibula. They are called Weber C type. And how are they produced? They are produced by pronation external rotation. So these are all pronation external rotation stage four, where you see all the components and you can see in varied form. You can see a large posterior malleolus sometimes. You can see all this subluxation happening and these are all fractures with syndesmotic disruptions. These are various examples. All right. So how are they being produced? You know, they are being produced by pronation, uh, external rotation in a pronated foot. Again, CT scan is very important here because that is what is going to show you the size of the posterior malleolus and will help you reduce this syndesmosis or this incisura and plan accordingly. It will tell you the direction of screws which you should you know, pass to give a good lag compression across this fracture line, which a plain X-ray just can't tell you. So forces of external rotation on a pronated foot producing different clockwise mechanism, first the, pro the medial malleolus, then the, then the anterior disruption, then the fibular fracture, and then the posterior malleolus. So all components are present in pronation external rotation stage three and four. And how do we manage them? Well, fix all the malleoli, medial, posterior, fibula, syndesmosis. Fix everything. And how do you fix syndesmosis? Either you fix with a cortical screw, posterior malleolus, you fix with a screw or a plate, whatever is the size, and syndesmosis you fix with a screw or a tight rope. So to summarize, I would say, broadly speaking, you have malleolar fractures combined with syndesmosis injuries. However, in Weber type A, which are below the level of ankle joint, syndesmosis injury is never seen. And in Weber type B, it may be present, it may not be present. When will it be present? It will be present in stage three and four, but it won't be present in stage two. Similarly, Weber C, which are suprasyndesmotic level fibular fractures. In them, syndesmosis injuries will always be present. So plan your surgery accordingly. This gives you an insight how to analyze your x-rays, how to analyze your injury, which involves malleoli as well as syndesmosis disruption. So once we know this, yes, there are syndesmotic injuries which need attention. Let me lay down a few principles of syndesmosis injury management. So we have syndesmosis injury, which is purely ligamentous or which is with 
a posterior malleolus. So if it is purely ligamentous, you have both the options, syndesmotic screws or tight rope. But let me tell you, pure ligamentous syndesmotic injuries are more nasty. So sometimes we are happy fixing them with two syndesmotic screws so that if one breaks accidentally by a patient ambulating and the ligaments have not strengthened, at least the second one you know, is there as a backup. So fix them with two syndesmotic screws. The distal most screw in the syndesmosis should be passed at least two centimeter proximal to tibial articular surface. And all screws should have four cortices fixation. And you can plan removal of these screws only if they are interfering with dorsiflexion. Otherwise, leave them alone. That's the consensus now. Tight rope, of course, is, is a very good thing. It permits a micro motion at the tibio fibular syndesmosis, doesn't require a removal, but then it's damn too expensive. A cortical screw is going to cost you not more than a thousand, while this tight rope is somewhere in the range of 40 to 50,000 rupees in, in Indian scenario. So the principles of treatment in syndesmosis injuries, whenever we have a posterior malleolus, is fix it if it is fixable. Whatever is the size, if it is fixable, fix it, either with a small screw or with a plate. Bigger fragments require a buttress plate. Small fragment, very small fragment can be fixed with a single lag screw. And if it's non-fixable, then treat it like a ligamentous. If it's a flake, it's a thin, very thin thing. You can't fix it, can't pass an implant through it. Then treat it like a ligamentous injury. That means stabilize your syndesmosis in such situations. But please never treat them in a cast because cast cannot secure syndesmosis. So here, when I'm talking about this uh, tight rope, I think few of you would be interested to see this small video on how the tight rope is done. So this is a patient <laughs> in which we plan a uh, syndesmotic tight rope fixation. So a guide wire is passed two centimeter above the articular surface, which is done after holding the syndesmosis. Over that, the cannulated drill is passed and it goes through all the cortices. Now, the tight rope, which comes like this in a ready form, is passed through that channel, which we have made with cannulated this thing. Tight rope goes in. And then you have a button here, which needs to be flipped. So this is flipping the button on the tibial side, on the medial side. And after the button is flipped, yeah, that's how the button is flipped. We pull it from the other side and we see, yes, it's stuck there now. And once it is stuck, we are ready to do the milking. Yeah. Now we are ready to do the milking and achieve the compression. This is the milking process. And once we have done the milking and it is completely tight, nowadays we have a knotless tight rope. We can leave it alone or I feel happy putting two, three knots over that to make it further secure that nothing goes wrong, you know, nothing goes wrong. So this is how a tight rope fixation is done over the plate, over one of the holes of the plate which we have put. May I ask you a question right now at this time? Uh, I think questions should be at the end of the... Uh, okay. the then, it will be, then it will become more irrelevant. Because it is no, no, everything point. will remain relevant. Don't worry, okay. I can go back again. Yeah. So yeah, this is after right. passing the tight rope. So six weeks later, the patient is, you know, uh, doing full weight bearing, having full range of motion. See the way the ankle joint has got reconstructed, come syndesmotic, everything taken off. This is after removal of implants as if nothing had happened. You know, there's such nice restoration of ankle joint and complete normal function. When we talk about syndesmosis, we also want to talk about the malreduction of the syndesmosis, which has been reported in literature to the extent of 83% in one of the studies. And these people with malreduction had a significant worse outcome compared to a good, well-reduced syndesmosis. So how do we prevent this? The best way is to have a visual control of the syndesmosis. So when, when I say visual control means you do a small anterior arthrotomy. This is the fibula. This is the incisura. You are able to see the fibula sitting into the incisura. This is the lateral malleolus. This is the tibial articular surface line. And what we call it, a Mercedes-Benz sign should be made. And that is the security that yes, you have done this reduction well. So as we are going forward in our learning objectives, I think we have learned to analyze the injury pattern and we have learned few surgical techniques. In surgical techniques, I would say there is an importance of positioning the patient. 
when you plan a particular surgery, you have to plan the position in which you are able to execute everything. So whenever you make the patient supine, it's always a good thing to put a small sandbag and a bump and a pillow so that the leg is slightly internally rotated and you are easily able to do things on the fibula. Uh, and once you've done this, you can remove these pillows and walk on the medial side. Similarly, when you're doing a uh, patient prone, as you would like to do for posterior approaches, uh, this is how you would like to put a small sandbag under the ankle. And in the lateral position also, you like to put a pillow and you people prefer to do the lateral position for posterior lateral approach because this approach gives you an easy work in condition for the medial malleolus as well. Second is tourniquet. So be careful about monitoring the pressures which is settled in the tourniquet. You can use a thigh tourniquet, you can use a calf tourniquet, whatever you are comfortable with. And the duration of tourniquet should never exceed two hours because that will lead to a lot of post-operative swelling and a wound closure problems. There are certain contraindications which you must always be careful. These are people who are vulnerable vascular problems, people who have vascular issues or people who have chronic injuries. In all these cases, please do a Doppler study to rule out DVT because you can land up with a potential complication of DVT and pulmonary embolism in such situations. Approach. Most of the time, the workhorse approach for the fibula is a lateral approach and the workhorse approach for the medial side is medial approach. But yes, certain situations demand a posterior lateral and posterior medial approach, especially when we have posterior manulus fractures. So this is one of the example of posterior lateral approach, just lateral to Achilles tendon. And uh, uh, you can, when you do this approach, you can fix both posterior malleolus as well as the fibula by using the posterior surface of fibula to fix the fibular fracture through the single approach. And this is a posterior medial approach, which is medial to the Achilles tendon going towards the medial malleolus, which would be required in certain situations where there is a comminution of the posterior malleolus or there is a large chunk of medial, posterior medial uh, fragment on the posterior aspect of tibia. Which side was first? We often debate this, but I think my, in my particular uh, experience and working, I would always love to do the simpler side first, the less comminution side first, because once you make the less comminution side stable, it gives you the length, it gives you the better sense of reduction on the comminuted side. In plants, we use often 3.5 millimeter small fragment locking, non-locking, anatomical plates, solid screws, CC screws. So all these are good. Whatever is available to you, whatever is good at your hand, you can use all of them. The basic principles are to be uh, managed that you should be at the end able to get a stable fixation in which you can mobilize them early. I have started using 2.7 millimeter screws for very small size fragments of the medial malleolus and I am very happy that they give a quite a stable fixation and I'm able to do a very good rehabilitation after using these small 2.7 mm screws. So rehabilitation, when I'm talking about rehabilitation in case one or case two, which I write, if you closely look at them, well, both are same. That means whatever you do, whichever way you do in case one or case two in SIR or in PER, you should be able to give the same rehabilitation schedule of putting a small slab for soft tissue healing for four or five days, remove that slab, put the patient in the removable AFO and start the ankle range of motion. This is for a good health of cartilage and start weight bearing as tolerated, maybe partial weight bearing after four weeks and proceed to full weight bearing at eight to 10 weeks. Of course, as you monitor the progress radiologically. So modifications are made for associated injuries and comorbid illness, diabetics, delay the weight bearing and things like that. So my dear friends, I think we have been able to cover my learning objectives, which I was to discuss with you. And uh, now I'm open to questions, discussions uh, from everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamal. Mm -hmm. That was a great, uh, I think, overview and uh, descriptive uh, uh, description of ankle fractures and how to go about assessing them, treating them and uh, rehab uh, protocols for these. So uh, if move on to, if, if you have any questions, uh, Dr. Olok, you wanted to say something? Take me on mute. Okay. 
am i am i audible yeah yes yes you are yeah yeah the two th- one thing uh, while you were doing the tight rope fixation the compression is achieved by the compression clamp am i right yes right uh, and then only because a commonly question which is being asked is that can, like uh, previously also four quarter size screws or three quarter size or fully threaded or cancellers or what not so much so much has already been told about the cylinder mode screw fixation so uh, the initial compression is achieved by the uh, clamp, clamp in a, yes. in, a, in a neutral position of the ankle yes in a neutral position of the ankle. not like previously uh, not like previously it was supposed to be dorsiflex and then fixed no no Now, in one of your case which was supination reduction injury which was initially done elsewhere where there was a shear fracture of the medial malleolus Yeah. Okay, uh, which was fixed by three screws. Two were transfers, and one was uh, uh, like uh, a straight going into the canal. There was also done a single metric screw. Uh, fixation no, not in that. In that case. Not in, in that. It was done. It, it was done by somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was done by somebody. That's what I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. That's what because it's again a common uh, mistake that uh, supination reduction injuries or pronation reduction injuries they result in a uh, disruption of the single metric. so that, those were two points which i wanted to highlight because uh, it's a common message which goes at that point is case it is a supination reduction injury it never almost never results in so a, i i, I said problem. that these are all weber a yeah. and they have never a syndesmotic disruption never right and uh, once but my talk since my case presentation is about to uh, be after a while so once one sentence i would like to highlight about your talk was uh, you fix everything right fix everything means uh, you fix uh, all the three columns that is It's a posterior one, lateral one, medial one. See column, and then yeah. fix the same desmosis. Yeah. So I, I would like to have your opinion when I'll be presenting my case. Okay. I think yes, absolutely. I think Alok, you'll have a very interesting case. <laughs> <laughs> and and you can every all see we, it's very difficult to stop, get Alok to stop talking, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and he's the live wire of the discussion usually. So I think thanks Alok for doing that. And basically, uh, uh, we will have all have very uh, you know we have questions. uh one thing uh, we can start taking questions actually after the case discussions maybe uh, but one question which uh, you know i would like to ask the panel how do you assess the syndesmotic stability uh intraoperatively do you how how do you know that you stabilized it well enough that it's not you know moving anymore is it only through open reduction or through any stress views or anything else uh, dr kamal would you want to take that first yeah so most of the times you know i say my analysis only tells me that i have to ha- this patient or this particular injury pattern has a syndesmotic in- disruption component or not so 99% of the times i am already decided that i have to do a syndesmosis fixation in this case only in 1% doubtful cases i do a stress test of external rotation or a hook test to check whether this syndesmosis requires a fixation or not is that the question answer which you were looking for yeah i think part, partly that was it uh, also uh, uh, what would you do intraoperatively sort of uh, you know once you fix this syndesmosis well i think once you are fixing this syndesmosis just do the anterior posterior translation and check that do the manual anterior posterior translation of the fibula if it is moving anterior posteriorly that means something is wrong with your fixation that will be before the that will be before the before fixation of the syndesmosis yeah i mean he saying yeah. he supposingly yeah. you've done after, it after, how do you want to check it yeah, after, after, after it? doing after yeah. doing how can you check baninda i would like to know after doing no. it how will you check means it? you can revise you can revise always you know yeah. if, if yes, you think the anterior posterior was... translation of fibula is taking place please yeah. revise it can i say something has gone wrong uh maninder can i say something yeah sure yeah i think uh, kamal sir has very succinctly and nicely said that 99% of the time he is sure because it was a master class which he presented and rightly so he said that the analysis of the x-ray is very important so once you can analyze x-ray properly you know yes there is the one this is the one which requires fixation of syndesmosis and in very little a very few cases where you still have a doubt you can do the per of assessment as said by dr kamal dureja sir secondly Dr. Alok was questioning when to do this test. Dr. Dureja has said that once he is fixing, and once he has done the fixation, he'll just do that anterior posterior translation to check whether it has been fixed properly or not. So in the in all the cases where it has been fixed properly, there will be no translation. And of course, if there is a translation, that means that it has not been fixed properly. I need to revise it. Isn't it that sir? Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, I, uh, please excuse my ignorance. Uh, if you have put in any any screw in four quartices from fibula to tibia, how can we assess the anteroposterior instability of the fibula? 
output. Once you have fixed fibula to the tibia using one screw, so how can we? F- I the- what I look, yeah. Basically, I think what you were coming at that we will, we shouldn't be able to move it. Isn't that right? Certainly, yeah, so certainly. What, I think what was said earlier that we should not be able to move it once it's fixed, and that's I think the test that you want to do is basically you know although very few of us will actually check it, but there was you know uh, very okay. because I've come across one patient you know which I had put tight ropes in and you know uh, and basically I was able to translate it and because the this is a f- uh, fixation which is horizontal. And this does will still maybe you know it will if the groove of the syndesmosis is not very deep, or the tibial uh, groove is not that deep, maybe you can still enter because it is opposite in the way of fixation because you're fixing horizontally and you're moving it this way. So there is a lot uh, of but there is a lot of leeway. There is a lot of leeway in a uh, this thing a tight row. While there is no leeway in uh, is to fixation. There is no leeway. So when 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 we talk about checking it. So it could be uh, taking a tight rope, you know. So uh, I mean, yeah. it's it's One. something you know which rarely would happen, but yes, there is a possibility. And second thing, second thing. Then my my, my second question comes because, okay. like Maninda said, it's uh, Maninda just a minute. How will you check uh, syndesmotic stability in a high fibula fracture where you have not opened it in a high fibula fracture so, after fixing, say, for example, the fibula? Dr. Kamal, you want to answer that? Sorry, if you if you have a supra syndesmotic fibular fracture, yeah. masseno fracture, masseno okay. injury, masseno. So there is no question of checking it. There is a syndesmosis disruption. Certainly. It cannot happen without that. You have to fix. So I'm, I'm preparing check it only? for my cases. <laughs> I, I, I'm, th- I'm sorry. What I'm conveying is in type C, Weber C, please don't try to check even. Plan. You've already done. Plan to fix yeah. syndesmosis. Yeah. Okay. I think let's Good. go to Alok. Thank you. Alok, Alok, my case, I, I shall share my screen. 